Thank you very much, Ali. I'm on, uh, welcome. And um, first up, I want to thank the Tax Institute very much for having me here today, in particular Robert Jeremenko. Um, it's very humbling to, to be speaking alongside such distinguished speakers. In fact, I had, I had hoped that they'd uh, serve some alcohol over lunch, actually, to uh, dull everyone's uh, perspicacity for, uh, for this segment, just in case I uh, do make any errors. <laughs> but, um, um, it's important to say up front that I think the Henry Review is an excellent document, uh, both for what it says and for the debate about taxation that it's sparked. If the whole document were introduced, we'd all be much better off. Um, <clears throat> now, the title of my presentation, a liberal critique. This is obviously not a liberal party critique. I just want to make that very clear. It's a liberal, small l liberal, classical liberal critique of the Henry Review. And my um, areas of disagreement are really more suggestions for improvement. But like I said, it really is a very good document. So what am I going to talk about? Well, firstly, I thought I'd go back into history a little bit and ask what makes a good tax system. Um, uh, now, then I'm going to talk about four different areas. Now, we've talked already today a bit about consumption tax. Um, then I'll talk about state taxation, which I also think is a low-hanging fruit. Someone else has used that phrase today, and I completely agree. Uh, then I'm going to talk about something which we haven't really heard much about, fiscal illusion, and then uh, taxation of capital, and then I'll make a few maybe political points about the outlook for tax reform <coughs> at the end. So, um, I've even got some pictures. So, if uh, listening to me is too taxing, um, you can look at the pictures. Um, so, the most basic question in tax theory and design is how should taxes be allocated given a requirement to raise a particular sum of taxation. Uh, two broad strands of thought are evident in the history of tax theory. Uh, one is the ability to pay principle, and I thought that I'd talk about that first. This goes right back to Adam Smith. Now, these are the four uh, criteria that he said in 1776 in his Wealth of Nations book uh, should be used to uh, examine a tax system or to, to evaluate a tax system. Now, I've highlighted that phrase in proportion to their respective abilities because it might seem as though, oh, well, that's all very clear. That's actually extremely unclear. And indeed, for the next 100 or so years, economists have been debating about what that actually means. <coughs> now, um, you can see from these points, basically, the equity, efficiency, efficiency, simplicity mantra that we hear so much, that basically comes from these four points. So the first one, I guess you would say, is all about equity, about the ability to pay. The next two, about certainty and not being arbitrary, levied in a convenient manner. These are all about simplicity. And I think from the last one, you can probably infer efficiency, that it's contrived uh, to take out of the pockets as little as possible uh, over and above that which it brings into the public treasury. And if you uh, take that to mean also economic uh, welfare costs, um, then that's efficiency. Um, <clears throat> now, John Stuart Mill, in his book, in 1848, The Principles of Political Economy, he, he really honed in on that red phrase uh, because he saw quite rightly that that was the one that was so contentious in proportion to their respective abilities. Um, so Mill, <coughs> there. Now, he thought that that meant um, a quality of sacrifice. So everyone should bear the same sacrifice in taxation. And this meant apportioning the contribution of each person towards the expenses of government so that he shall feel neither more nor less inconvenience from his share of the payment than every other person experiences from his. Um, <clears throat> now, he actually specified a functional form. I thought, I'd, I thought I could get away with having some maths in this audience. Um, although my maths is rather rusty, I realised last night I'd actually written down the wrong equations. Anyway, um, it's now correct. So it's just a, a standard log function. And he thought that someone's utility, U, was basically a function of their income in that manner. So the more you earn, the less valuable each extra dollar is to you personally. And that was the same for all human beings, kind of like a law of nature, if you like. And based on that, he came up with a tax schedule that he thought was a reasonable approximation of that. And it's remarkable, I think, how close our thinking about tax today, um, even the Henry Review, is to his, uh, to his suggestion, if you like, which was basically to have a tax-free threshold. Um, he thought the most practical way uh, to make it operational, to make this, uh, this idea operational, was to have, it, to have a tax-free threshold so income for the necessities of life could be satisfied, but without any indulgence. So it's a question or not as to whether Henry's $25,000 tax-free threshold allows any indulgence, and I'll leave that to you. I mean, I, I've kind of thought about it recently, and, and for a single person, $25,000 a year of untaxed income, I think maybe it's a little too high. I think it does allow some indulgence. Um, I think you can live in the eastern suburbs, rent a room, and live quite well on, on $500 a week uh, of net income as an individual. Anyway, that's just food for thought. 